Hello everyone, welcome back for um, the part two video for um, the informal fallacies uh, module of critical reasoning. Um, let's go and do some more fallacies. Our, our next two fallacies, if, I don't know if you remember, but in the last, in the previous video, we were finishing up some fallacies that were in the category of relevance violations, the relevance principle from the Code of Intellectual Conduct. And I was talking about how there's kind of two divisions, um, these fallacies of irrelevant premise or fallacies of irrelevant appeal. And we were still in fallacies of irrelevant premise, which meant that these were arguments that had relevance issues, but where the premises being irrelevant for the conclusion, they might only be irrelevant for this particular conclusion, but they could maybe conceivably work as evidence for some other kind of conclusion. Then the next two fallacies that we're going to talk about kind of go hand in hand, and they're in that category still. One of them is called drawing the wrong conclusion, and the other one is using the wrong premises. So, um, or I think there's actually a slightly different name here. Drawing the wrong conclusion, using the wrong reasons. So, close. Reasons, premises, same thing. Um, both of these fallacies are really the same mistake, and it's one of the more general types of fallacies, so it's not a very specific thing. This is a little... This is a little wider. Um, and they're really the same problem. It's just depending on the context of making that mistake, it would be one of the fallacies or the other. So these fallacies, here, let's take a look at the definitions from the book. <clears throat> I'm going to kind of do them together. So drawing the wrong conclusion is drawing a conclusion other than the one supported by the evidence presented in the argument. And using the wrong reasons is defined as attempting to support a claim, a conclusion, with reasons other than the reasons appropriate to that claim. This is really the same thing. These these definitions might be like, you're like, what's the difference between those? And there isn't one. There really isn't. Both of these are fallacies that are a matter of having premises that are basically not useful for providing a support relation for the conclusion. You basically are making irrelevant claims. You're trying to defend a, a certain claim and you're using premises that don't defend it, or you've got some evidence on your hands, and then you draw the wrong conclusion from it. And that's really the only difference. It's what's sort of been set up in the context of the conversation up to this point. So <clears throat> and my favorite way to describe this is actually to tell kind of stories, uh, give anecdotal stories as examples. Because the, if you're thinking about these fallacies in terms of the conversation, then I think that's, that's the right way to think about this. Um, what's already been established in the conversation uh, and where is it going next and that's how you'll figure out whether it's using the wrong reasons or drawing the wrong conclusion. So let's talk about um, using the wrong reasons. So uh, here's an example. Um, I was, uh, it was in grad school and I was working at a cafe near my house. I might have even told this story before <coughs> because it's actually kind of relevant for a couple things. I, I almost I'm almost positive I told this story to you once before. I use it for so many different things. Um, so I, I was I was having a discussion in a coffee shop while I was like in the middle of procrastinating on some homework. Um, and I was a student too. I know how it goes. <laughs> uh, and I was talking with someone else and we were having a friendly debate about um, about faith, about religion, and whether God exists. And my conversational partner was an atheist and I, you know, I'm a theist. And so we were having a really great debate about it. Um, I knew this guy. We had good rapport. We trusted each other as being sincere people who were really interested in the truth rather than just trying to rationalize or like all this sort of stuff. Well, someone was overhearing our conversation and wanted to jump in. This was kind of the, I always describe this cafe as kind of like the most icely cantina of Kalamazoo, Michigan, because uh, it was kind of like the very friendly, uh, very open, uh, not a lot of boundaries. So people would butt in in conversations all the time, and it was it's not like, Starbucks in Seattle or something. Um, so someone butted in the conversation and they were like, yeah, this guy is so right because of all of these reasons. He's like, you should totally believe in God because what about this, this, and this? And all the things that, that he was offering as reasons in support of the position I was defending, I was like, oh man, no way. Like I actually felt more in league with my atheist opponent than with the person who was supposedly on my side because of the arguments that he was offering. I just thought they were very bad reasons to believe in God. That if that was your basis for faith, then that wouldn't that wouldn't be so good. Um, so I, some, I probably have brought up this case before as an illustration of how 
you know, it's, it's not in, in debate. It's not just a matter of what conclusion you're defending, but how you're trying to, what reasons you have for defending it. So, in terms of these two fallacies, that case, if <clears throat> the arguments this person are offering are really irrelevant to defending the conclusion, then that would be using the wrong reasons. There's already a conclusion that's been like put on the table. Like when I was arguing, you know, I was like, I'm defending this position. I think you should believe in God and hear my reasons, right? But that position had already been defined. And then if someone else wanted to jump in, or even if I wanted to like jump in with my two cents on that, if someone wanted to be like, you know what? That's so right. It's so right because of this. Then that, and if the this that's being offered is irrelevant to the original claim that's being defended, then then that would be using the wrong reasons. Now, if it had been a little different, if we had um, put some sort of considerations or evidence or observations on the table in the discussion already, and then someone is like, oh yeah, you know what, that's so right, and it just it proves that this is true too. And then they, they try to advance a conclusion of inference from that stuff that's already been said. But the conclusion that they're drawing from that is irrelevant, like the, the evidence doesn't support that, there's not a good support relation here, then that would be drawing the wrong conclusion. So this happens a lot where someone tries to take a conversation and kind of hijack it to a completely irrelevant subject that's different. Um, if they're doing it in the sense of, uh, here are these things that are observations, and therefore we draw this conclusion that goes in this other direction from there, then that'd be drawing the wrong conclusion. If it's, here's a position that's been put on the table, and then they're like, yeah, and that's so right, because of these other reasons that they are totally irrelevant, then that's using the wrong reasons. So um, when you're on the exam looking for these fallacies, the first thing I would say is you shouldn't be looking for these first because these are pretty general fallacies. They're pretty big. There's a lot of cases that would fall under cases of people using irrelevant appeals for a certain type of conclusion. So that can happen a lot. It can be a very common sort of fallacy. So it's general, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't answer it right away. You'd want to answer the more specific fallacies first in the exam. But then when you've got some stuff left over, so once you've gotten the more specific ones and now you're kind of left with a bunch of general fallacies, go looking for cases where the it feels like the the speaker is kind of almost changing the subject, like giving reasons that are really poor for some conclusion or drawing a conclusion that is not supported by the evidence that's been put on the table. There's a there's a link of irrelevance. Try to get that first, and then figure out, you know, how's the conversation proceeded? Is it going one direction or is it going the other? If you're starting with the premises, then it's drawing the wrong conclusion. If you're starting with the conclusion, then it's using the wrong reasons. So that's my tip for those two. And now we're going to move on to um, a different set of relevance fallacies. These are the fallacies of irrelevant appeal. And as I, I talked about, um, these are uh, irrelevant arguments, but they're not cases where the premises could maybe work for some other conclusion. They're like, no, this is, this is always wrong. This is always a bad idea. Now, even here, it's possible to fix things. There's, it's often possible to take an argument that commits one of these fallacies and fix it. Some of these are not fixable, but some, but some of them are, and I'll, and I'll talk that through as we go. Um, when I say here in the lecture notes, these should look very familiar from the beginning of class. Um, I'm speaking to, uh, in that first intro lecture, I had a section that was um, some notes from one of my colleagues, um, a philosopher named uh, James Gibson. In his critical reasoning class, he talks about these different um, things that are obstacles to us using critical reasoning more in how we make decisions about what to believe. Um, and some of them were like conformity, peer pressure, uh, stuff like that. And these, these uh, fallacies are definitely uh, connected with those sorts of forces. Um, we talked about the Milgram experiment there, and that's like irrelevant authority, um, just not reasoning well with authority, so, so uh, about appealing to authorities. So they... Um, that's what this is all about. But that was kind of optional. I didn't lecture through it very much. So if they don't look familiar, <laughs> then you didn't miss something here. It, it, it's okay. Because um, we kind of, I, I went through that pretty quickly. I think I might have even skipped it for time. But these, all of these fallacies, there, there's actually kind of two uh, categories that I, I might group these together. Appeal to irrelevant authority, appeal to common opinion, um, an appeal to tradition are all uh, kind of in a, a family of um, arguments from authority. 
um, I'd say tradition and common opinion are more specific versions and appeal to relevant authority would be more general. And then uh, the other ones are kind of in their own sort of category too. You got appeal to force or threat and appeal to self-interest, which definitely go together and they're all under the more general category of manipulation of emotions. So I'll actually draw some pictures as we go here, but um, there you can kind of lump some of these together. And I think I actually might do appeal to force or threat after tradition so we can kind of talk about the fallacies that are more similar to each other. So let's start with uh, appeal to relevant authority. One important thing to remember is that um, appeals to authority are totally acceptable arguments. There's no problem with them. Um, we make a lot of arguments based on authority. Um, maybe you accept something from authority on me, that I, my authority and expertise in the field that you're taking a class from me about. Um, that when I say something about how the you know professional philosophy is like these days, that you know you trust me, you believe that that's true based on my report, because um, I'm an authority there. Or how um, your car mechanic is an authority, more of an authority than you on what's happening with your car, or when you go to the doctor, or there's all sorts of cases where we take arguments from authority, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. I'd say all arguments from authority um, are still they're still definitely inductive because they can never provide an argument, an appeal to an authority could never be an absolute proof for something. You're not going to get a valid argument out of that. It's just going to be strong, and they, and they can be pretty fallible. Um, but they can also be still strong arguments. They can provide good reason for believing that conclusion is true. We do this every day, and it's it's rational behavior. Um, appeal to irrelevant authority is as a fallacy, as like a bad way of reasoning, is kind of picking out three various ways that argument from analogy can go wrong, that a way that it could go bad. So let's talk about those three. Let's look at the definition here and kind of talk address each one at a time. So, attempting to support a claim by appealing to the judgment of one who is either, one, not an authority in the field, two, the judgment of an unidentified authority, or three, the judgment of an authority who's likely to be biased. So, this first one, um, who's not an authority in the field, my favorite example of this is when um, you take a specialist in one area and then ask for their opinion about something else. Um, one, of, one of my favorites is uh, when um, scientists get interviewed to discuss ethical matters or sometimes metaphysical ones, like things that are about the ultimate nature of reality that science isn't in the business of studying. There's a distinction between science and metaphysics, philosophical metaphysics. So when they, but let, let, that one's a, a little difficult for me. I that might require some more explanation. If you want to ask me about that sometime, I that's. I'd love to talk about that. Philosophy of science is very fascinating, uh, and that would be in that area. But So let's stick to the ethics example, because that's a little more clear-cut. Just because someone is um, a very intelligent human being doesn't necessarily mean that they are an authority about what is the right way to live, or what is most meaningful, or how to deal with uh, all the difficult challenges of uh, being a human being in this world, and what's the best way to live. Um, just because someone has a high IQ doesn't mean that they're a specialist there. So if you got like a physicist who is speaking about ethical matters or maybe political matters or sociological matters um, or psychological matters, they're like, that may not be their area of expertise. And we have a tendency to treat um, beings with authority that uh, extends beyond what they are actually in the, the field that they're an authority in. We do this all the time. Um, so that's that's a ki kind of fallacious reasoning. So if I, um, I mean, in certain examples, it'd be like absurd. It'd be like, of course you wouldn't do this. Like, just because your car mechanic is an expert about your car doesn't mean you're going to go to them for legal advice or about like health advice about your health, right? It wouldn't make any sense to do that. So um, that's something to keep an eye out for. The second one is the judgment of an unidentified authority, and this happens all the time too. Uh, how many times do you hear every day something like, studies have shown, blah, 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 blah. It happens a lot. If you're really going to make an argument from authority, uh, you need to provide your source. you got to tell people where where is this authority coming from. You can't evaluate whether an argument from authority is a strong or a weak argument from authority until we know what we're actually evaluating. So that one's a little, little more straightforward. Now, this might sound a little familiar um, because this was a part of assuring. You know, we could make appeals to authority 
but if I don't tell you who the authority is or any of the information about it, then it's not really a full-fledged argument from authority. Um, and, and so we've got to keep that in mind. I mean, assuring isn't giving an argument, but there is a time and place to use assuring uh, to indicate that there's an argument. Take, for example, the fact that in the world that we live in today, there are just studies going on left and right. There's so much going on. I mean, you can't keep a little Rolodex with you about all the scientific studies that have informed your beliefs that you can just pull out and give to people as you're having discussions with them. So oftentimes we do say things like studies have shown. And that's okay because it's, I mean, it's suggesting an argument. One of the things that um, we were talking about as a part of the appropriate use of assuring is that assuring doesn't make up for the fact that uh, in accordance with the burden of proof principle from the Code of Intellectual Conduct, it is always fair for your opponent to ask you to back up your case. So if you, as you're kind of informally arguing, you might be like, you know, studies have shown that this is true, you know, I believe this, and they're like, well, I was like, I think I read it in a, in a journal article somewhere um, that, that scientists had done some experiment, I think it was kind of like this or something. I mean, you might not have it all there to lay out, but if they're like, yeah, you know what, I'm not so sure that's true. I'd, I'd want to take a look at that study. Then you'd be like, okay, well, I'll, I'll try to find it or something. So you, you want to supplement it later. Um, so that kind of thing can happen, and that's okay. But if someone, uh, we shouldn't mistake that kind of um, behavior <clears throat> in a dialectic as an actual legitimate argument that is fully supported. In other words, when someone's asking for the source, that's like one of the basic things for making it into an actual argument that can be taken seriously. Um, so keep that in mind. That is a kind of, if that was treated like a good enough argument, then it wouldn't be a good enough argument. That's all that this is saying. Okay, and then finally, you might have an identified authority who is an authority in the field in question, who is like an expert on the kind of thing that we're making the conclusion about, but if there, uh, if there's some uh, likelihood or concern about bias, that can really interfere with, you know, using, basing the conclusion on that um, authority's report. So if there are things like conflicts of interest going on, or where their ego is sort of wrapped up in it, and or some some reason, or it's connected with a sensitive subject for them, or um, that's loaded with sort of their political affiliation. I mean, there's a lot of different ways in which bias can show up, like we've talked about before, and um, those are things you should consider when you're um, willing to trust an an a, port, an a report based on an authority. Um, I've been kind of kicking around whether I want to forward um, this article, and I, I think I might post it. If I'm mentioning it now, then I, I think I definitely have to now, um, <laughs> in case you're curious about it. If I forget, someone remind me if you if you want to get this. I'm, I'll probably put it on an announcement or something. But there's a uh, article I was reading this last week about uh, a Stanford study. So this I actually have the reference. I can send you the report from this study. I've got it as a PDF, <laughs> so I'm not making a unidentified authority appeal here. Um, but it was a Stanford uh, experiment that was done um, studying kids at, uh, at younger grade levels and then into high school and then in, in college students as well for how well they're able to critically reason about online content. And a lot of online content is, you know, taken on authority. And whether people are going to follow up on checking those sources, that they're aware of potential bias, the, 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 there are all these other things that are important to critically reasoning about information that you receive from an authority. And the internet is a notoriously uh, fallible place to get authoritative reports. Um, you know, there's been a lot of fake news going around in this election cycle, and, and that's kind of always been happening on the internet, but it's kind of really been shoved in our faces more recently. Um, so that's an important thing to be able to uh, have on your radar. You want to be looking out for these three aspects when you're going to take something on authority. These are three things that could make it bad. Now, <clears throat> an argument from authority can still be a weak argument even if it's not making these mistakes. But these are kind of like basic things that we ask out of any argument from authority in order for it to be good. Um, <clears throat> I've always thought about putting a section on argument authority into exam number two because it is a type of inductive reasoning form, um, but they are very notoriously difficult to evaluate, and there's a lot of controversy about what are the appropriate standards. But this kind of stuff that's in this fallacy, these are definitely like baseline, large large range of agreement here that and consensus around these standards being important. Um, okay, 
So enough about argument from a th uh, appeal to a relevant authority. Let's talk about the next two. I mentioned, uh, so appeal to common opinion and appeal to tradition are, um, I'd say, kind of in the theme of authority appeals. Um, because instead of the, being the authority of like a single person, with appeal to common opinion, you're treating whatever most people believe as somehow authoritative. Or, in a case of appeal to tradition, you're appealing to um, the authority of a certain traditional practice or belief or cultural element or institutional element or something like that. So they're just more specific things that you're treating as authorities and these things are notoriously problematic. Now the thing that I want to emphasize about both of these next two fallacies is that there are ways in which they could easily become good arguments. It's just that the fallacy is like imagining that the issue of making the argument is just as simple as appealing to common opinion or appealing to tradition. Okay, So um, appeal to common opinion is not that hard to understand. It's like saying this thing is true because most people believe that it's true. And hopefully that already kind of makes you cringe a little bit. Um, it's There have been countless cases where what most people believe is true has still turned out to be false. There is no guarantee, or, guarantee here that what most people believe is what's actually going to be true. It doesn't even increase the likelihood of it. And the problem here is that there are a lot of forces that affect people's belief and what's involved with it. Um, if you knew that that belief was based on some factor out of which people have been able to be proven to be notoriously good at judging those specific types of things, now we've got an okay argument on our hands. The problem is that you see how all that other, there's other premises that have to be added in there. You'd have to have these background assumptions and knowledge about what's going on with people, and that's really a part of the argument too. The mere fact that most people believe something doesn't make it true and doesn't add anything in terms of increased likelihood of the conclusion being true. It's not just a weak argument, it's irrelevant. It doesn't help us in the slightest. Only if you start adding extra things in there does this actually turn into a good argument. So like, um, let's say I'm maybe concerned that I might be colorblind. Um, so I ask like all of my students in the classroom, like 40 students, like, what color is, is this shirt? What would you, what color would you say this shirt is, you know? Um, so if most people said red and someone else gives some other answer, I'll be like, I'm going to go with red because most people said that. But it's not just the fact that most people said it was red that I'm thinking of that makes that kind of a rational inference. It's also that um, people's judgments about color have a kind of regularity to them that I can kind of count on and that there's a lot of good reason. There's a lot of evidence for noticing that there's a lot of regularity here in how uh, color is perceived. Um, again, I've got some studies I can show you about that, but there are some differences, of course, and there are actually some interesting cultural differences about color, but um, there is a startling amount of regularity about it, and so I could maybe trust what most people would say about that. Um, I'm sure someone is going to be watching this video and being like, but is color really something objectively true, or isn't it just a subjective perception, and blah, 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 blah. We could talk about that. Um, there's, uh, just take this at sort of face value. There is a deeper philosophical discussion. I'm very aware of that discussion. It's actually one of my favorite debates to get into, uh, how we understand color properties, what sort of reality do they have. But at a, even if you're concerned about the subjectivity of color, you um, are still sympathetic with certain ordinary claims that we can make about what color things are that are maybe not, you know, have a lot more philosophical sophistication to how we're going to do this song and dance about what those things really mean and that kind of thing. But So if you want to debate that, also feel free to contact me sometime. You're always free. I, a lot, not a lot of students have done this, but this quarter. I've probably only had like maybe two or three conversations the whole quarter with people about stuff that was sort of tendential or not necessarily directly related to the class. But you're always welcome to contact me for these extra philosophical adventures if you want to sometime. Um, okay, where was I? Common opinion. If it's just the fact that most people believe it that the argument is appealing to, that's bad. If you back it up, if you're like, well, here's the report of what most people said, and here are all the reasons why we should take their what they say as an authority, now we're on different footing. Now that could actually work. That could work. Okay, But you can see how, in most cases, it's going to be hard to prove 
that other stuff, right? About how what most people believe is going to be generally right. Like, for example, if you use common opinion to defend ethical conclusions that most people think it's okay, then I'd be like, yeah, I'm, not, I'm kind of nervous about that because I'm nervous that that most people have the correct view of what is ultimately morally and ethically correct. I mean, I think that's a really difficult thing, and the wisdom that's involved with ethics is very difficult to attain. Um, so, those are some examples. Okay, uh, appeal to tradition works in a very similar way. The very, very similar problem here. The mere so appeal to so uh, actually appeal to common opinion, appeal to tradition. And the genetic fallacy, I think, are easily mixed up with each other. I'm bringing back genetic fallacy. And I, specifically with appeal to tradition, there can be an issue here. So I want to help clarify and, and help you identify what's different about these, how to draw these lines of distinction. So appeal to common opinion is saying the fact that most people believe something is true makes it true. Appeal to tradition is saying we should do this or we should believe this because that's what we have done in the past. We've believed it in the past, or we've done it this way in the past, so we should continue to do it that way. Um, that's basically what appealing to a tradition, like an institutional tradition, if you're talking like a church or um, a research academy or um, the United States government or something like that, or like legal precedent. I mean, ap the, appealing to those traditions um, all, always involves this kind of logic of this is how we've done it, so we should continue to do it that way. If that's all that's offered, that's a terrible argument as well. Just because we've done something a certain way in the past doesn't mean we should continue doing it. It might not have been the right thing to do in the past, but we still might have done it anyway. So, um, you know, just because maybe a court ruling happened in the past, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should respect it going into the future. Okay. Um, now, again, appeal to tradition can make sense. I mean, there is a legitimate basis for legal precedent. I mean, also, once we start getting into legal issues, and governmental issues, there are some pragmatic justifications for doing things a certain way, rather than the, necessarily the belief that they're true. But it's like, well, if there's if we're not sure what's true, then how do we are, how are we going to proceed in a system of cooperation? Maybe something like precedency is important to that process for pragmatic reasons. But even putting that aside, um, there's ways in which appeals to tradition can be helpful for getting at the truth, and it's again to treat the tradition as an authority. So if I say, we've done it this way in the past, and, or, you know, like this tradition, this institution or whatever tells us to do this this way, because that's how they've done it that way before. If I add to that something like, and here's why we should trust what's going on with that institution, then we're on good footing again. Um, you can actually treat, I mean, what counts as a tradition can, is, can be very broad. Um, there's a kind of uh, tradition to how science has been done. There's certain techniques that get passed along. Um, there, there's definitely a culture to science. There's been a lot of sociological studies about like sometimes how that's problematic or that there can be certain amounts of cultural bias that are involved with um, the community of scientists in how they pursue science. And so, so scientists are human beings. Philosophers are human beings. Same thing happens in philosophy too. Um, there's a risk of um, a certain habit that we could fall into that might cause us to miss something. Sometimes it could be justified. Um, maybe there's some reason why that tradition is, is something trustworthy, and other times not. And so, um, at the very least, the, the appeal, the, the flat appeal to that we should do it this way because we did it the way in the past, that's, not, that's always irrelevant. But if you add in and make this into a kind of argument from authority, then it could work. It could be strong. It could be weak. It depends on how much you should trust this institution. I'd say something like the, um, the tradition of chemistry is doing pretty good, and we should continue to trust it. I mean, I take some things on authority from that tradition and that the research methods, me methods that they continue to use are good. And a another important part of the tradition of science and philosophy, they both share this, is a tradition about critical reasoning. Though, like, we should hold ourselves critically accountable and rethink the assumptions that we have. That's also a part of our tradition. That's a part of, of what it means to be a philosopher. And someone might come along and be like, well, just because we've always done it that way, maybe we shouldn't continue to do it that way. Maybe we got the answers. Maybe we don't need to check up on ourselves anymore because we figured it all out. And I'd be like, okay, maybe we have to look at that. Let's look at the case that you've got for that um, rather than just assuming it, that it's going to be that way. But that aspect of the tradition has been one of the things that has made these 
um, made these uh, endeavors so successful. So I think there could be some good things that come from those um, traditional practices. Um, certainly if you are religious then this is also nothing that is terribly new to you that um, there can be authority that comes from tradition that um, and it's not necessarily a way in which you're gonna treat the people who came before as these absolute authorities that you're gonna never think critically about or something like that I mean it's possible you could take it that way and then that would be fallacious <laughs> that'd be bad critical reasoning but there's other ways um, to to treat figures from a tradition with reverence and respect as authorities if they've earned it, right? If they got the credentials to back up themselves being authorities, then then that is also rational. So uh, in talking about all these fallacies, I don't want to give the impression that um, appeal to authority is something bad. I mean, that's not what these fallacies are saying. They're saying that when you're not taking it seriously, like what it takes to defend an argument from authority, then we have a problem. Okay. Now, there's one other thing I, I want, we need to get in here, and that's what I was alluding to earlier about genetic fallacy. So, appeal to common opinion. Everyone believes it, so it's true. Appeal to tradition. We've believed this in the past, or we've done this in the past, so we should continue to believe it, or continue to do it. That's the best way to think about it, appeal to tradition. Genetic fallacy was saying, this was true in the past, so it'll be true in the future. That's a little different from appeal to tradition. With genetic fallacy, it was like, it's actually true. It's not just a matter of what we believe to be true. It was actually true in the past, so it'll continue to be true. Appeal to tradition is about us and our behavior. Our behavior about what we're doing, or our behavior with respect to our beliefs, like what we choose to believe. Right? So we've chosen to believe this in the past, so we should continue to choose to believe it. That, that kind of thing is what's going on with tradition. So in trying to get the distinction here between tradition and genetic fallacy, listen for whether the pattern from the past to the present is a matter of truth, that would be genetic fallacy, or whether it, it's um, belief uh, or practice, and then it would be appealed to tradition. So that's a way to, to keep those things straight. Okay, our next three fallacies are back to uh, fallacies um, or no, yeah, so these are still fallacies on the category of um, appeals to ir or irrelevant appeals um, rather than fallacies of irrelevant premise. And I actually want to do some drawing here. So one of the biggest categories of fallacies that we've got, one of the most general, is manipulation of emotion. Manipulation of emotions. This is such a huge uh, category of fallacies. So many things qualify as manipulation of emotions. I we couldn't make a complete inventory of them. Um, the book. I, let's actually skip ahead a little bit. You know, the book talks about a bunch of different things. Um, oh, I don't have it listed here. Um, if you go on through the reading, here. Let me find it. Okay, here we go. So um, we got. Whoa. I didn't mean to do that. I thought I just had it. <laughs> um, manipulation of emotions. Here we go. Um, so there's five types here that they talk about. Appeal to pity, use of flattery, assigning guilt by association, appeal to group loyalty, and appeal to shame. Um, there are so many other ones other than this. But those, that's a good list uh, for considering manipulation of emotions because so many of the other ones we've got on our list qualify. Appeal to self-interest is going to be a manipulation of emotions. Um, appeal to force or threat is going to be doing that. You're like a, you're using fear, right? You're manipulating a person using fear. Even appeal to tradition. You notice the the book's definition here is a little different than how I talked about it. Um, they're talking about appealing to their feelings of reverence or respect for a tradition instead of to evidence. Um, that I think appeal to tradition goes a little broader than that, and I explained what I think is the right way to think about that. But it, this is certainly one that would also qualify as appeal to tradition, and that is definitely also going to overlap with manipulation of emotions. So this is definitely one of the fallacies to save for the very end when you're doing the exam, because so many things, I mean, I would say maybe maybe a third to a half of the problems on the exam, I would accept manipulation of emotions as the right answer. Because remember, there's going to be overlapping categories of fallacies here. So Again, you want the best fit, but 
if you use manipulation of motions for something that's a more specific fallacy, then that would mean there's you have to use that one for something else and you'll get that one wrong. So save manipulation of emotions for later. But um, appeal to um, self-interest is certainly in the category of manipulation of emotions completely. Any case of appeal to self-interest is a case of manipulation of emotions. And same thing for appeal to um, force or uh, threat. Now, so when I was talking a second ago about appeal to tradition, I think appeal to tradition works more like this, where there's some overlap. Um, I think it, I think it'll look like this because some cases of appeal to tradition are emotionally manipulative, but others are not necessarily. So um, it might look like like that. And there's a bunch of other ones that are going to get in here too. Uh, a bunch of the fallacies that we'll talk about later in our list too will work this way. But that's manipulation of emotions, and no real surprises here that manipulating emotions is a bad thing. This is like the distinction we've made so many times in the class about the difference between making a good argument and persuading people. If your goal, like that, you, I, you know, I've talked about this distinction between sincerity and insincerity in arguing, and the sincere motive in an argument is to try to get at the truth. And what I talk about as insincere is when you have some kind of ulterior motive, like you just want to win. That's it. That's a competitive thing rather than a cooperative, truth-seeking sort of project. Um, that's what I mean of being like more insincere. Now, if all you want to do is win the debate, you want to just persuade your audience or get them to give up or look good to some other audience that's over you know, that's kind of watching you have this debate with somebody else, like, say, like presidential debates, then you're not going to really care about uh, whether your arguments provide evidence for the truth of your claims, um, your conclusions, but anything that would get people to agree, you're going to be happy to exploit. So manipulation of emotions is kind of like um, exploitive rhetoric appeals um, in general. Um, when you're sort of um, pressing on people's uh, emotional buttons to get them to agree with something rather than that they are convinced by the evidence in the argument that it holds water to criticism fairly considered blah 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 okay so manip manipulation of emotions is bad it can be hard to um, fight back against this uh, for a lot of reasons but you know I think with the manipulation of emotions the big part is to stick to your guns to not fight fire with fire um, to continue to appeal to a rational argument to not bite on the bait of emotional appeals but instead to evaluate them fairly um, and uh, and you know just stick to using rational tools for resolving this rather than um, than more manipulative tactics that you're using back at them now another thing I'm always fond of saying about this is that um, talking about emotions or emotions being brought into a debate is not irrelevant that's not a problem Emotions can have argumentative weight like I've talked about in this class before. So it's not like if anyone is trying to appeal to your compassion or something like that, that they're therefore guilty of a fallacy. <laughs> there can be, um, you can talk about giving argumentative weight to a certain emotion, a particular emotion, like maybe like an intuition, like a moral intuition or something like that, if you've got, if you're committing yourself to the argumentative backdrop that would assign significance to that. So if you want to say, yeah, you know, I think I think everyone has a moral sense. They have a conscience that's calibrated in a way that's sensitive to things that are morally real. So we can trust our moral intuitions to do that. Now, I, you know, me personally, as a, I'm an ethicist first and foremost, and I don't like using intuitions to back up um, ethical judgments. But there are a lot of other of my colleagues that do. Intuitionism is one of the major fields in moral philosophy. Um, as a like kind of a meta-ethical thesis about how uh, normative claims, ethical claims can get justified. Um, so, you know, some people argue that way, and that's fine. Um, I think our emotions are, at the very least, a good indicator of where arguments might be found. And to be completely insensitive to them in an argument is not justifiable. I think by calling manipulation of emotions a fallacy, we're not saying emotions themselves are a fallacy. What's problematic is when someone is just trying to get you to agree with them by manipulating your emotions rather than looking at them as 
evidence as argument. There's room to do that. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about manipulation of emotions. We've got these two more fallacies, appeal to self-interest, appeal to force or threat. These can be, actually I should have drawn these pictures slightly different. There can be some overlap going on here as well. I mean, you might say that appeal to force or threat is an appeal to self-interest, and I would buy that. But here's how we're defining it. Um, you know, if we're just speaking generally with these terms, then I would agree. But here's how we're defining it. Um, well, let's look at the book's definitions. They're actually not bad in this case. All right, let's start with appeal to self-interest. Oh, no, no, no. Let's let's start with let's start with uh, appeal to force or threat. This is just like straight up bullying, Bully, bullying, blackmail, extortion. These do not provide reasons of the right kind. We, you remember way back at the beginning of this quarter, we talked about the distinction. Like, what does it mean to give a reason for someone to believe something? And we were saying, like, this is not a reason, right? All that a threat can do is give you a, a reason to behave as if you believe something was true, but it doesn't provide actual evidence that that thing actually is true, right? It can never do something like that. So... Um, Using force or threat to try to convince someone to go along with something, to do something, or to believe something just doesn't work. I use the example, I think, of uh, the Dark Ages in France when warlords were going around converting people to Christianity under threat of death. I mean, the axe over your head is not evidence that Jesus really is your Lord and Savior, even if it might convince you to say as much to whoever is holding the axe, right? So that's the important distinction here. Now... I want to make it slightly more detailed than this. Um, attempting to persuade others of a position by threatening them with an undesirable state of affairs instead of presenting evidence for one's view. The key part is that the, it's sort of unspoken here in this definition. This definition is great, but the problem is I would want just to point out to make it explicit that in appeal to force or threat, you, the person who is arguing for the conclusion, is the one who is the source of the threat. So if I'm, I'm like, you should give me um, $5. Why? Because otherwise I'm going to beat you up. I'm the source of the problem, and I'm the one who's making the argument as well. If someone else was like, dude, you should give Tim 5 bucks, or he's going to beat you up, then that's not appeal to force or threat. Because the person who's giving the argument and the source of the threat are not the same thing. That would actually be an instance of appeal to self-interest. Okay, so... Let's go and look at appeal to self-interest now. These are very similar to each other. Urging an opponent to accept or reject a particular position by appealing solely to his or her personal circumstances of self-interest uh, or self-interest when a more important issue is at stake. This last thing is important because there are certain things in which appealing to a, per a person's personal circumstances or self-interest is all that is uh, relevant to um, the debate. Like, for instance, if someone was, if you were like... Um, Let's take, I'll get, here's a setting. Um, I'm like, I'm standing in front of the snack machine, and I'm like, I don't know, should I get a Snickers bar or a Butterfinger? And someone is like, you should get the Butterfinger, Tim, because I know you, you love Butterfingers. And I'm like, you're right, that's right, I'll get the Butterfinger. Right, something like that. Um, the person who's giving the argument about what I should do is appealing only to my personal circumstances. But arguably, this is the only thing that matters in this situation. of The controversy over Snickers or Butterfinger and which one I should get is really just a matter of what I would prefer. My preferences are pretty much the only thing that is um, at stake here that would matter in that controversy. So that would be okay. If someone's trying to give you, uh, let's say you're getting advice from uh, an academic advisor about um, like what major you should you know and they're they're gonna cite your personal circumstances as maybe a reason why you should do one thing or another in the sense of like what do you want to do what are you passionate about that's totally relevant because in that that decision is mostly made on those kinds of bases here's an here's my my favorite example of appeal to self-interest it's so pertinent um, and it's something that I think often gets forgotten uh, and and this is a little bit of my opinion but I don't think it's stretching that much. I, I'm actually like, I'm not, no. This, yeah. Ah. Eh, yeah, I'm on the fence about this. I'm not even sure whether, whether I should tilt the hat or not. I mean, that's how uh, basic I think this is. I don't think that this is really something that is rationally controversial. And the reason I'm struggling with it is that I'm like, I'm having a hard time coming up with any decent arguments charitably for my opponent here. And when that's the case, then it's like, Maybe this isn't such so much of a controversy, but it is controversial in the sense that not everyone agrees. But remember, there's a difference between 
controversy and rational controversy. This is a side tangent. I've talked about this distinction before, but this is important for philosophers. Okay, so here's the, here's the case. I'm thinking of people uh, and how they vote. So I think a lot of times people vote based on their personal circumstances. That you're going to vote for uh, a candidate or for a law if it's in your self-interest to do so. If that candidate is beneficial to you. So when people are trying to say things like, you should support this law because you're actually going to receive this extra tax break. You know, that's why you should vote for it because it's going to cater to you. Something like that. That's actually a bad argument. That's appeal to self-interest because there are more important issues at stake here. The entire United States government does not exist solely for your benefit. It's for everybody's benefit. So if I'm thinking about whether I want to vote on this law or not, and let's say it's like uh, tax cuts, right? And I fall into the category of who's getting the tax cuts. Um, I might oppose that law even if I'm the one who's going to come out better because I might judge that's not what's best for my community, my local community, my state community, the nation, right? For our government. Um, that's how you're supposed to vote. In as much as the things that are relevant for how we should run the government goes beyond just what happens to Tim Lineman or what happens to you. It's a bigger issue than that. And so to kind of get on on my axe grinding horse here to mix metaphors too, uh, how many things can I do at the same time? Um, I'd say civic engagement is a matter of ha try, put yourself, putting yourself in the position of trying to decide what's really better for everybody, not just for me. Uh, democracy is not just a way in which you get to leverage your personal circumstances to your self-interest. The idea of democracy is that uh, the choices that happen in our government are, at least in some ways, put into the hands of citizens. And citizens need to hold that power the same way that like a dictator would, like uh, if, if you had like a king or something, or, or a queen. If they were going to be a good monarch, they would have to try to figure out what's good for everybody, not just what's good for them. A lot of them did that, and then we'd say that's not appropriate. Well, now what happens if you take the power out of the monarch's hands and give it to the people? Still the same standards. If you just had uh, millions of people acting out of self-interest, it's like a million little dictators. That's not going to be good for the country. So, so that's an example of appeal to self-interest. When someone's giving you an argument to say, you know what, you should really agree with this, or you should believe this, because it actually is the best benefit for you, pragmatically. Like, just think about your situation. You should do that. It's good for you. Um, and there's some other issues that are at stake other than your self-interest, then that's appeal to self-interest. Um, students oftentimes uh, try to use a shortcut here, and I wanted to warn you about it because I've seen it blow up in a lot of people's faces. Sometimes people want to say, okay, appeal to self-interest, that's like positive, and appeal to force or threat, that's negative. And that's the distinction between the two of them. But that's not the distinction that you should be listening for. You should be listening for, um, well, for one thing, appeal to self-interest could be like it's to your advantage to do this, like there's something positive to be gained, and then that would be self-interest. But it could also be like you should do this out of self-interest to avoid this bad thing from happening. That can still be appeal to self-interest. But if it's going to be appeal to self-interest and not appeal to force or threat, then the person who's making the argument needs to be different than the source of the threat. Okay, so the person who's appealing to, to self-interest is just pointing out like what's going on. They're not the ones that are contributing actively to you being in that negative position or having that potential negative consequence attached to you. Okay, so um, that's what you should listen for. If it's something bad, it's like don't do this because something bad will happen. If you don't agree, something bad will happen. Listen for where's the source of the threat? Where's the bad thing coming from? Is it coming from the speaker? If that's the case, then it's appeal to force or threat. If it's coming from some other source, then it's appeal to self-interest. So watch out for that. Okay, we um, we knocked out another six fallacies, so that's a good schedule here for us. Um, and we're coming up on 50 minutes, so I think I'm going to call it that a day. Um, you know, we've got a couple more we could do here to finish off lecture six. Yeah, I think I'm going to save these for the next one. They're, they're kind of opening up another can of worms. Um, this feels really good as uh, two little morsels, and we got done with uh, relevance fallacies, so feel pretty good. All right, um, I'll see you next time.